three meters okay. right on the side. Good evening. This is the, the commencement of our uh, webcast tonight. Uh, welcome to the HRM chapter presentation. My name is Phil Rogers and I'm a member of this chapter. Before we begin tonight, before I introduce our guest speaker, I'd like to make a couple of housekeeping announcements. For you at home, you can type in your questions as the session progresses, and we will answer them periodically through the session. And for those here in Halifax at the meeting, uh, we also have evaluations. We'd like you to complete those. And for those of you at home, if you would please provide any feedback you can, that would be uh, appreciated very much. It's my pleasure to introduce Golda Matthews tonight, who is speaking on the topic, Stages of Change. Golda is a clinical therapist with the Addictions Program with a background in social work. Her work experience has primarily been working with individuals struggling with harmful involvement of substances and gambling, while also impacted by mental health concerns. Golda has done a lot of individual counseling with helping people through the stages of change, while also supporting family members. Golda's current role is primarily group treatment with those most harmfully impacted by addiction. Stages of Change, which is a CDHA-sponsored uh, program, is a way of thinking about and understanding the process that people go through when making behavioral changes. Please join me in welcoming Golda Matthews. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the lovely introduction. Um, I definitely don't want this to be formal at all. Uh, so I wonder if we can just do some first name introductions. So I actually know some names of people in the room. Um, that would be okay. So, whoever Todd's our technician. Hi, Todd. I'm Wonder and Roadcast. I work with Schizophrenia Society in the main office in Dartmouth with Steve. Okay. And uh, I, just, I think the sixth, sixth one of these I've done, or fifth one, and uh, I quite enjoy the process. So it's a lot of fun. My name's Lyndon. Hi. Donna. You know me. You know me. And Phil. I'm Phil. Wendy. Wendy. Nancy. Nancy. Mary. Mary. Yeah. Hi there. All right. How many folks do we have joining us on the webinar tonight? Uh, four. Oh, all right. Great. Um, so we're going to talk about stages of change. And at any point in time, if you guys have questions, uh, just feel free to ask me. Uh, stages of change is actually a model. Uh, it's been researched to death, uh, really, and it's used in a lot of different um, healthcare fields, not just in addictions and not just in, um, in mental health. And really what it is, is just a way of understanding how all of us go through uh, the process of making changes. And uh, I'll get into actually describing the model a little bit and we'll talk about it. Uh, but all of us can kind of relate to making changes, right? You know, all of us here, I suspect, have probably tried to make a change at some point or another. Whether we've tried to, um, I don't know, maybe go to the gym more often, or maybe we've uh, tried to eat a few more vegetables, or maybe we've tried to drink more water, or maybe we've tried to lose 10 pounds, or you know, all of these things can all relate to, right? And we all go through, the research would say, a similar uh, process of, of thinking about change and getting to the point where we actually are making changes. Um, and I would suspect that probably not only does everybody in the room have experience with trying to make changes, but you probably also have experience in being successful with making changes. Okay, so if you want to just reflect on, like, you know, maybe a time you've made a change, maybe something really small, maybe, maybe it was a large change, right? Maybe you've been able to stop drinking coffee, which I can't seem to do very well. It's always my stage of, uh, I'm always going through the stages of change with coffee, and I'll, I'll describe it a little bit later. Um, so get an idea in your head of what something may be recently that you've tried to make a change to. And, and maybe you've had some success with it, or maybe you haven't. And even if you haven't had success with the change yet, maybe you can identify where you are um, in the stages. So. All right. Who's heard of stages of change, by the way? I know, Donna, you have. Okay. All right. You have the yeah. yeah. So. All right. Maybe when I start uh, when I start writing it out, people will uh, will know exactly what I'm talking about. All right. So we start off with. Pre-contemplation. Will be bad if I don't know how to spell it. <laughs> <laughs> it's late. <laughs> but pre-contemplation. Any idea what that means? Thinking. About Not it. even thinking about it. Not even thinking yeah. about it. Yeah. Right, so you're getting ahead of me. Oh, all right. <laughs> Next. <laughs> So not even 
thinking about it. So if tell, give me an example of what that might look like. Uh, a smoker that is perfectly okay with smoking and doesn't really think that there's any reason to quit. Yeah, right. Or maybe I eat a chocolate bar every night and I'm completely fine with that. That's something that I'm very happy with. Like, you know, I feel no need to change that. Maybe it's I drink eight glasses of water. It doesn't have to be something bad necessarily or something to have some negative connotation. But I'm just, I'm happy with where things are or um, the idea of needing to make a change to something is not even on my radar. Like, so far out there, it would be like me deciding that... Um, like, I need to hike Mount Everest. Not even thinking about it. Not even considering it. Where I am right now about coffee drinking. Right? So, come on in. So, contemplation would be the next stage of change. What does contemplation mean? That's thinking about it. That's thinking about it. Exactly. This is technical difficulties in my world, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So contemplation is you're thinking about it. You're considering it. You're contemplating it, really, right, is what it is. Um, give me an example. Thinking about the coffee you shouldn't drink. <laughs> thinking about the coffee you shouldn't drink. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe I'm thinking about how much money it's costing me. Right? Maybe I'm thinking about, God, it kind of gives me a bad belly. And then when I don't have a coffee on the weekend, like I get a headache, and maybe I'm just thinking about it though. But eh, you know what? It's not a big deal. Like you know, those cold mornings of coffee is amazing. So what else? Right? What else? I'll go get my teeth cleaned every six months and, and not worry about it. All right. So, um, but I'm thinking about it. Right. I'm not doing anything about it. I'm not. Um, I'm not even. I may be weighing some of the pros and cons here, but I'm not. I'm not doing anything too serious. With so, do you guys have your, your change kind of in mind of something you've tried to do recently? Yeah. Do you remember being at this stage? I've been at that stage for about <laughs> 10 years. <laughs> I second that. Yeah. All right. You yeah. know, on a number of yeah. things that yeah. need to be changed. Yeah. So usually. I can't move. So I'm, hoping, I'm hoping that's where you come in that you can tell me how to move from the contemplation. Uh -huh. To action. To action. <laughs> All right. So there's a really, re so you're, you're actually getting ahead of me because action is down here. And there's a really, really important step that we have to consider before we go from contemplation into action. Um, any idea where that might be? Could you repeat that? I'm sorry. Right. So Donna just said that she wants to, she wants to know how to get from thinking about right. it to doing it, right? Yeah. And so there's a really important stage that we actually go through. So there's planning. Planning. Plan? Beautiful. Yeah, that, that's exactly it. It's a preparation and planning stage. I think that's what I don't do. <laughs> mm -hmm. it's, it's actually, I just want to stop right away. Yeah. So, um, as Phil had said, I work with addiction services, and a lot of the work that I actually do is helping people with this piece, right? Because that's the part where most of us kind of forget about it, right? You know, we want, uh, we're in kind of an instant gratification society, and we want, if we think about something, we want it in our hands, or we want to see the results, right? So not just that we're instant gratification, we're results-oriented. There yeah. seems to be something for me, I think, yeah. between the contemplation and the preparation. Right. It's, it's like a, a, a mental, uh, you know, my, my uh, I have to go in mental preparation. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. so maybe that's, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Because before between, I can get into the physical preparation, I have to just, I can't explain it. I just know that it happens. Yeah. There's a whole process there, actually, that happens. Because right? yeah. you're right, you don't go from thinking about it and considering it and maybe weighing the pros and cons into just pre preparing to do something different, right? Yes. Like, you know, these are actually little short arrows that I have here, but it's actually a pretty long process for some folks, mm -hmm. right? And for some people, like, you know, being right here in contemplation, this can be a really long time. Right, like you know, and that's <laughs> Tana said ten years. <laughs> uh, right, and for a lot of folks, like you know, even the planning piece of it, like you know, the planning really can be that mental preparation piece where you're really doing a lot of the well. If I were to do this, what's going to be the outcome? And it's a lot of the consideration pieces, right? Because we can't just go from thinking about running a marathon to running a marathon. Right? So the planning and preparation piece is a huge piece. And as I said earlier, that's the part where I do most of my work in addiction services. 
is really being able to help folks figure out, like, you know, what do you need to do to be able to implement the change that you're looking for, right? So maybe we'll just go right into action, right? Action is for <coughs> when you're doing it, you're implementing it, you're, you're planning and your preparation is getting ready to do it, and maybe even taking some of the preliminary steps, like, you know, in preparation and planning, but action is when you're actually doing it, right? You're taking action towards the change that you're hoping to see in your life. Um, can someone give an example of these two stages? I guess if you if you were going to your your plan was to run a marathon, then yep. you would have to sort of think about what you would have to do as far as physical activity training in order yeah. to be able to do that. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a whole lot of different things that would come into play there, right? Maybe it's figuring out like you know, well, what what type of marathon do I want to run? Is it is it a half marathon? Is it the full shebang? Is it just going to be a ten kilometer? Like mm -hmm. you know, marathon doesn't have to actually be the forty two. Right, like you know, what kind of sneakers am I going to wear? Like you know, who am I? Where am I going to train? It's going to be indoor or outdoor. Where am I going to run it? It's going to be the Blue Nose in May, or am I going to go to Boston? Right, like you know, there's all kinds of preparation and planning pieces, and then there's the actual training. So it's not just the, the mental planning; it's the actual. Maybe I need to be able to run a kilometer, right, or a mile <laughs> before I get to to the 42. Right, so so is is a big big piece there. Right, so the action piece. What would that be? Let me actually doing it. Yeah, you're actually doing it. Yeah. yeah, like, you know, maybe um, it's the weekend off, right? Maybe it's I've done in my training, like, you know, I've done the equivalent of the marathon. Maybe I'm engaged in a regular training program that's, that, that is um, really not just preparing me, but really I'm ready to mm -hmm. do it, right? And I'm doing it because um, I'm doing all that money, right? Um, any other examples? Looks like. Anybody have an example from your own personal life that you're comfortable sharing with the group around some change where you've done this? I I've stopped smoking about six years. Oh, amazing! Congratulations. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. So, did you? How many times did you go through this before you got oh, here? Ten years. Yeah. Uh, probably twenty times, and yeah. maybe ten, ten to yeah. fifteen, whatever. Can't remember. Yeah. You know, and I did I did successfully like for five months. Yeah. Went back with Dr. Right. Boy, you know. Amazing. Yeah. Good. For sure. Amazing. Is it okay if I if I go with that example? For that's sure. Like, I smoked for thirty five years. Oh wow, that's yes. a more incredible thing. So really, you know, we'll go into the rest of the description of the of the stage of change, right? Of this model. And so when you go past action, maintenance, anybody have any idea what maintenance might be? Keeping it up. Keeping it up. Yeah. yeah. Exactly it. You're keeping it up. So you've not only done the action, but you're you're keeping it up, right? Like you know, so it's you being stopped for for six years, right? Amazing. So um what about relapse is here? And, uh, and I put it there because it, it is a part of the stages of change model. Um, it's not something that always has to be a part of the stages of change, like you know, whenever we're looking at making some changes in our lives, but it's commonly a part of it. And um, and oftentimes the times the relapse is a part that strengthens the stages that we go to, right? Because if there's a relapse, it doesn't mean that you automatically go back to not thinking about change, right? Maybe if there's a relapse, you go directly back into your planning, right? Maybe you're you don't even need to do this. Maybe maybe you're never pre-contemplative. Maybe there's a behavior like you know, or a change that you're looking to make, right? And you're always thinking about. Right? Like, you know, it's never been a time like, you know, when you've not considered doing something different. It's just that for whatever reason, like, you know, this piece has been a struggle or, or maybe there's been the supports, maybe there's been a lot of things that's gotten in the way of being able to implement the change that you're looking for. Um, so is it okay? Is, is it Nancy? Nancy. It's Nancy. Yes. Right. Okay. So we're going to go, can we go with your smoking sure. example? Because you said that you stopped for five months. Right. Right. So in five months, you would have been, I would say, you were firmly down here in action, probably well on your way of maintenance. Right, because you were stopping smoking, you stopped for several months, and what happened after five months? I was at Niagara Falls, and my husband at the time smoked. Yeah. And I had some wine. Yeah. And so it was like, give me a cigarette, and make sure you have enough to last the night. Yeah, went back after the relapse. So what happened? Like, you know, did you uh, did you smoke in for another thirty five years? Oh goodness God. <laughs> <laughs> that was not so good. <laughs> Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> no, but I did relapse. Right. 
into so, a full smoker. Yeah, all right. Yeah, because and, uh, it, it was a gradual back to smoking. Yeah. You know, I won't do it tomorrow. I'll give you, you know. Yeah. So, just for yes. today, yeah. just one. Yeah, I'll stop. Then, I'll stop yeah. How long did that go on? Oh, I stopped smoking when I was at Monarch Drive, so... Oh, geez, I probably smoked another 10 years after that. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yes. Before you got back. So tell me about that 10 years. That 10 years that you smoked after your five months of kind of having a lot of success. Right. Because right? five months is a ton of success in, in, in stopping smoking. Did you go right back to pre-contemplation? Were you probably. Like, yep, yeah. yeah, okay. Yes. When did you go back to contemplation, do you know? Or was it like thinking about it and then not thinking about it? Uh, yeah. Yeah? Always. Yeah, it's always a juggly neck when you're a smoker. Did yeah. you ever do the, and I'm sure, like, given this is January the 12th, maybe we've all had some recent experience with this one, where you go from not thinking about it to, yep, it's January the 1st, that's it, New Year's resolution, I'm done with the chocolate. Some people do that, I, I don't. Yeah. Anybody ever do that? I do it, and I don't. I fail. <laughs> I mean, you know. Yeah, I, thought, I mean, I did, quit, I did quit the longest I've quit for, yeah. and I've quit several times. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's three and a half months. Amazing. Yeah. That's but, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. But then I wanted a cigarette, and mm. I took a cigarette. And you started a cigarette. Like yeah. yeah. So when we think of, again, stages of change, <coughs> we sometimes think of um, associating with giving up something negative like, you know, or, or stopping something, a behavior that we don't want. But sometimes it can be starting something, too. Right? Like, you know, um, it could be um, maybe going to the gym, right? Like, you know, maybe I'm very content with not being able to, like, you know, walk up um, the, the four set of stairs, like, you know, to my, uh, to my building, right? Like, you know, and then I'm thinking, like, I'm so content with it, I'm not even thinking of anything different. But maybe it's just like, you know what, like, you know, I'm noticing a couple of my coworkers are going to the gym at lunchtime, I'm eating lunch by myself, and, you know, I'm not really liking this so much, like, you know, and, and maybe, um, Maybe my husband, like, you know, he's playing sports right during at home by myself three nights a week, and, and maybe, you know, I just want to feel better about myself, right? So I start thinking about, maybe I want to get in better shape, right? So I'm thinking about this for a little bit. So it's not just stopping something, it's starting something too, right? Maybe I'm thinking about it. I'm going to, maybe maybe I'd like to get in better shape. Maybe I'd like to be able to um, feel fit, right? So what might be the next step? What could be something I would do? That would move me from just thinking about it into preparing and planning. Like a tour of the gym? Yeah, the excellent. Program. That yeah. would be fantastic. Like, you know, maybe I'm going to figure out, like, you know, what's the best gym? Like, you know, do some research. Get out there and walk through them. See if I see if I have, like, some adverse reaction. Like, maybe there's hives or if I start to throw up. Or, <laughs> right? Those are things I might hope for. <laughs> right? Like, you know, but it's actually going out. Like, you know, doing something. Maybe it's, like, you know, like I said about the marathon thing. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's going to be um, figuring out, like, you know, where, where should I start? Like, you know, maybe I'll see my doctor. Maybe I'll, you know, maybe print off a program. Put on the maybe I'll talk to a personal trainer. Talk to a friend to get somebody to do some Absolutely. Beautiful. That's the planning piece, right? That's the preparing piece, right? Maybe I start thinking about, well, what am I going to do when I've worked late, I haven't had supper, and um, and here it is, my beautiful plan to go to the gym, like, you know, is just going to go out the window. So I know me, and I'm going to want to go home, sit in front of the fire, and I'm going to want to eat. Like, I don't want to go to the gym. Right? So what am I going to do in that situation? That's some of the more higher level planning for change, right? Is thinking about what could trip me up. What could get in the way? And, and maybe I'm going to start planning for some of those situations. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe I'm going to start considering all of the different angles here. right? Maybe I'm going to maybe keep my gym bag in the car you know, so I'm never caught off guard. Maybe I'm going to think about how I'm going to use my lunch hour differently. right? And this is, this is higher level planning. This is not just you know deciding that I'm going to go to Good Life up in Clayton Park. This is actually... Figuring out, like, you know, what's going to, what could potentially trip me up, and what do I need to do differently so I don't trip up, and I'm going to be more successful. Um, action would be, like, you know, maybe I've, I've gone to the gym, right? Maybe I've gone to the gym a couple times in a week. Maybe I've figured out a schedule, and and this is what it is I'm going to be doing for a period of time, and and I'm sticking to it, all right? Maintenance would be after I've been doing this for a period of time, like, you know, and I kind of have things down for down, down, down to a bit of a science now when I'm in maintenance, right? Like, you know, I'm not actually worried about so much when I'm hungry. I keep an extra um, 
I was gonna say chocolate bar, but I will probably <laughs> chocolate bar in my bag. Maybe I have like you know, some extra nuts, nuts and and dates, like you know, in my bag. Like you know, so if I'm hungry, like you know, I, I'm not giving myself any excuses. And if there's an excuse that comes up, like you know, for me not to do something, then like you know, I get a, a ready way of like you know, just being able to talk myself back into maintaining the change that I've already implemented in my life. Right? Maybe I've relapsed. Maybe I've Christmas got the better of me and. And now I'm back to like you know oh god like you know I haven't gone to the gym like you know in three weeks and you know I'm feeling really lousy and um, what if I were to say like you know after after three weeks of that that I go back to maybe um, re-examining my excuses and having that mental battle with myself where am I where would I be? What if I go back to putting my gym shoes in the car? Okay. You're in the planning preparation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, any questions about this? No. All right. It's pretty simple, isn't it? Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, but there it. must be steps within the steps. Yeah. So tell me about that. Because <laughs> you don't just think about it, you know, like you said, and then, yeah, yeah. Yeah. so I don't know what they are, actually, I kind of... What, because you, but you've done this, Nancy, so, mm. you know, what might be one of the first things that you would have done when you, when you were in that contemplation stage, and you were thinking, maybe, maybe I should stop smoking, maybe this is something that, like, you know, maybe I'm spending too much money in it, maybe I'm worried about my health, maybe, like, you know, it's just, it's not as easy to smoke anymore, right? I gotta go, like, 15 meters right from the door, and... The control. Yeah, like, you know, the control. <coughs> Maybe I don't like feeling like there's a ball and chain. Alright? So so you were having those thoughts. What did you do? Because you didn't go from just thinking about it to doing it. What did you do? What was your first thing? Um, gee whiz, I'm trying to think. Well, there was a lot of contemplation. Yeah. That mental preparation, right? Yes. What was the first thing that you did? The first step that you took outside of mental preparation? Um, to prepare? Yeah. Kind of seems like I did a lot in the contemplation. I knew what I had to do. I set a date. Set a date. Yes. Beautiful. That's yes. like you know a very very typical first first step preparation. Yeah, I have to go back there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I also uh, talked to the doctor and I right. got some. Um, I had AIDS. Yeah. I could never do it by myself. Oh, you you still did it, honey. Sorry. I said, you still did it, honey. Oh, for sure, <laughs> for sure. No, no. You still did so it. I I took whatever drug was yeah. there. Yeah. And follow follow that procedure. Yeah. Yeah, regimen. Right. And then yeah, I said it. Did you tell anybody that you were planning on or that you were thinking about stopping smoking? Yeah. Yeah. So you told some people you got some support. Yeah, so it was financial as well. Yeah. A lot of money being spent on yeah. cigarettes. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I I really wanted to do it this time. Yeah. And uh, actually I'd never thrown out my ashtrays before. But Did so I, I learned time? more, better planning and preparation, maybe. Right. You know, and, and this time I didn't want to fool around. And I knew it was going to be hell. Yeah. So I acknowledged that. You know, I knew that. Yeah. And uh, I also didn't want to replace the cigarettes with food. Right. Because I've done that. Mm -hmm. And so I, uh, I found uh, some food solutions that, that would work. So a lot. Again. Beautiful. Yeah. Well, it's a huge addiction, mm -hmm. as you know. They're just huge to uh, to overcome. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm actually, Nancy. I'm actually hearing a ton of planning and preparation that you do to be able to stop smoking. Hey, it took me ten years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But it also sounds like you know that you had some experience, like you know, with with the relapse. With the relapse. Yeah. Telling you, like, yeah. you know, that this is something that might I might need to do differently this time. True. Right? True. Yes. So, yes. Okay. And, and they say that you you have to quit smoking. I don't know how many times before you really do it. So. I didn't really realize how relapse played such a prominent role, I guess. Yeah. 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 Um, actually, they say that the relapse, like, it is a part of a part of the stages of change model because it happens, like, because it is such an important part of the learning, right? If we were able to, um, every time we tried to make a change, like, you know, that we were just completely 100% successful. successful, like, you know, then it probably wasn't that challenging of a change to make, right? We probably could challenge ourselves a little bit. And it's not that people can't do that, because people, I, I most certainly see that, like, you know, in my field of work, some people do, like, you know, uh, but that's the exception, that's not the rule, right? The rule is that, like, you know, relapse, relapse would, be, would be a part of the process um, that allows for some of the better preparation, some of the better planning, right? So, 
it sounds like you did some pretty high level planning though, Anne. When you think about the, uh, you're putting a lot of focus on the contemplation. I think that the mental preparation that you went through definitely would have put you in that stage. Put me in the stage of? Of preparation and planning. Right, yeah. okay. Yeah. yeah. Anybody else think of any changes that you've went through recently or maybe even decisions that you've made? Well, this is kind of an odd one mm -hmm. um, in that um, sort of uh, really focusing on priorities ah, instead right. of thinking, you know, uh, I have to get 10 things done yeah. this week and you know sort of stewing about it and and not getting them done and only getting half or a third of them done and just sort of feeling like a failure so the last few months i've just sort of tried to relax a bit mm -hmm. and think that it's not the house isn't going to burn down <laughs> you know we don't have any major problems if i don't get these projects finished and um, just work along and take my time and not get anxious about it Mm -hmm. Fantastic, right? Like, you know, so you didn't go from like, you know, uh, doing things one way and thinking about things one way to doing something completely different. It sounded like there was a whole process there mm -hmm. where, you know, maybe you weren't aware of that for a long time mm -hmm. and the way that you were making lists maybe didn't work so well mm -hmm. for you. Mm -hmm. And then you started figuring out, right? You're in the contemplation piece. You're like, oh, God, there's got to be a different way of doing this, mm -hmm. right? And then you started thinking about, well, like, you know, how can I do it differently? Well, I can talk to myself in this way, like, you know, and figure out that it won't be the end of the world if I don't get the way mm -hmm. that I planned, and, and then you started thinking that way and, and maybe doing things a little differently. Like, are you still in action or are you maintenance? Like that? I'm more in maintenance. Yeah. You're more maintenance. Yeah, yeah, and it's much better. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, great. Well, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> was that? I don't know. Uh, just said hi, maintenance. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Still maintenance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So if we look at this at this as a model for the process that we go through when we're making when we're making changes, um, I wonder where does somebody telling us that we need to make a change fit in? Somebody else telling you. Yeah. Ooh, so somebody says, Nancy, you need to stop that smoking. And Wendy? You need to stop worrying about stuff you haven't done. <laughs> I think it brings it into your consciousness, though. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Would it would it help you move through the stage stages of change? It depends who We're says right. it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I want to rebel. <laughs> yeah, sure it does. The doctor told me I, I had high cholesterol, so I had to cut right. certain foods out. Yeah. Well, I did. All right. Mm. All right. Was there a process there for you? Or was just like, mm -hmm. yep, he said it, so I gotta do it. Yeah. Wow, you're a great patient. <laughs> <laughs> it's felt like you're like every doctor's yeah. dream. Yeah. yeah, he told him yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> but there's always like there's there's always roadblocks, you know. Like yeah. and as you were saying, like you know, you, you try to watch what you eat, and then it's Christmas. Yeah, it's Christmas is food and sweet. Celebrating and wine and liquor. Yeah. And, and food equals love. That's right. Yes. Food equals celebration. Yeah. Food equals reward. Yeah. Yes. Major. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> I do. <laughs> that's, that, that's a real problem yeah. when you're, you're trying to do things differently. Yeah. But then, then I think sure. that's where you have to have those other things. Decide on the options. What so other options? Planning for when you know if Christmas is coming or you know you're going out drinking and partying, what are you going to do? Are you going to smoke or not? You know, so you have to figure out what you're going to do when those roadblocks mm -hmm. come up. Absolutely, and I would listen to me. I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you're more into action than you know. <laughs> so, so that was actually answered her own question, right? Yeah. You know, how do you get from thinking about something to doing it, right? Like, you know, and that's where like you know we, we think about the mental preparation that comes into whenever we make change, right? Because change is actually quite difficult, right? Quite difficult, and and we want to think we want to be able to, as humans we try to simplify stuff, right? We want to be able to think of change as being simple. We'll just stop it. Dr. Phil, actually, <laughs> Dr. Phil said, "We'll just stop it." <laughs> <laughs> no, 
<laughs> right? Human behavior, we're much more complex than that, right? And, uh, and change is actually really quite difficult, right? And for change to be easy is actually pretty, pretty I might say, is that normal? You know, for change to be easy, right? And, and if you're somebody that change comes really easily to them, then fantastic, that's, that's, that's great. Uh, but that's not usual. Change is actually quite hard. And we think about the small changes that we're able to make, like, you know, then uh, how much work can sometimes go into that. Because it's not just making the change, it's actually then maintaining it. Right? Mm -hmm. And all of the preparation and planning that goes into being able to make a change. I think we're actually wired to resist change. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe a good piece of that is the fear of the unknown or the fear of the road not yet taken. Mm -hmm. However, am I going to manage yes, once yeah. I've quit smoking? Right. Is there life after if, cigarettes? Is there, <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. At least the sure. devil you know is the devil you know. Yep. And this whole new world that you're going to be living in is unknown in some way and therefore makes you feel very fearful. Yes. So I think, I think that... Um, so I think most of my career has been spent around helping to facilitate change. Mm -hmm. And the biggest piece of um, helping people get from either pre-contemplative to contemplative or from contemplative to planning is to help face the fear, mm -hmm. right? And, and mm -hmm. toy with the fear a little bit. And um, so things like inviting people who made the change and lived to tell the tale mm -hmm. to come and talk about how that felt and how it worked for them and the up and the downside of making the change not thinking that the change is going to be perfect because right. it's never perfect right. there are a lot of things that are rotten about not smoking <laughs> not <too laughs> there's many. a lot there's a lot of good <laughs> stuff but i after 17 years of smoking i quit and mm -hmm. i miss it still yeah. mm -hmm. that was uh 30 years ago that I quit and I miss it still mm -hmm. um, because there were a lot of really comforting things about smoking and a lot of pleasurable things about smoking and those things I miss. I don't miss the money that went out the window and I don't miss the um, all the downsides but I miss the good parts of it and you always will I think but I think it's facing that too you know admit and you know accepting that the change isn't going to be you know, heaven. Mm -hmm. It'll be better, hopefully, but it won't be heaven. And I think fear is a huge part of sticking where you are. Yeah, absolutely. And you're bringing up a hugely mm -hmm. important point. And, and oftentimes it comes up in contemplation and in a preparation planning stage, but, but most definitely in contemplation. And that's really like, you know, figuring out, like, you know, the pros and the cons, right? Like, you know, because if everything was bad about it, you never would have stuck with it. Right? Like, you know, if everything, if we think about whatever, so me drinking a coffee, if everything was bad about drinking coffee, like, you know, I probably be easy to <laughs> yeah, like, wouldn't have made it past the first cup, right? Like, you know, if everything was bad about the smoking, you wouldn't have been in it for 17 years, yeah. right? That doesn't mean to say that there isn't a downside, like, you know, but in contemplation, you're really taking some time to really figure out, you know, what are the pros and cons, not just of what I'm doing, right, but what are the pros and cons of changing, right? Because sometimes they can be a little different, right? Because there, there are downsides of changing. That, that's a really important piece. A part of the work that um, that we do at Addiction Services is often around uh, motivational interviewing, right? So really being able to look at, like, you know, and thoroughly examine, like, you know, what are some of the pros and cons of, of, of change? What are some of the pros and cons of where you are? And when we call it, I call it a little bit of like picking the edge of a piece of paper, right? Like, you know, like peel back that label a little bit and create the discrepancy uh, through conversation. Through conversation about pros and cons, and through conversation about, like, you know, where do you want your life to be, and where is it right now, right? And and really be able to work on that. And that's really some of the preparation and planning piece, right? Tap into values, and to be able to, to talk about. Yeah. Goldie might want to just explain briefly what motivational interviewing is. Mm -hmm. Many here I know know, but yep. it's yeah. good to review that. So motivational interviewing um, is actually an approach and a way of being with people. It's called like interviewing, but it's actually not interviewing. It's really a way of counseling, um, and and it's a way of being with people. So you're joining with them where they are and respecting, like you know, that not everybody is going to be right down here or even at contemplation, right? Like you know, some people that we work with are going to be pre-contemplative, right? 
maybe they're coming in in an apps. You know what? I'm not even thinking about change. You know, Happy where I am. My doctor told me I needed to be here, and that's why I'm here. You know, I don't care. Right? There was yeah. one piece of the puzzle that was really different, and I never really understood the role that it played until, and I would have to repeat a bit of what you said. Mm -hmm. But I was at Lawton's once, and and uh, when I was trying to do the quitting thing and uh, planning for it and everything, and there was this young uh, pharmacy student, and she had on, uh, she was putting up a smoke, smoking um, station. Uh, maybe a few days down the road, and, and somehow I got talking to her, and she asked me if I would like to come, what? and I did. Yeah. And if I, I went in, and I was sitting and talking to her face to face, and I was able to tell her that I didn't know if I could do this. And she was so good with me about that, and it was kind of like just a huge hurdle. Yeah. So that was like this motivational Repeat that for me, please. It's, so I'm not sure what I just said, but right. you're, you're reminding me of something that's so important because in order, to, according to motivational interviewing and the theory that it's based on, right, in order for change to happen, in order for someone to move from contemplation into the stages, and then there's three components that need to be there, right? We need to have confidence that we can do it, mm -hmm. all right? So a, a big part of motivational interviewing is actually working with people with confidence, all right? We need to feel like you know, that this is something that's doable and that I have... If I don't have the resources right now, then I can gain the resources, I can gain the skills to be able to do this. I need to be confident that I'm going to be successful at it. Um, maybe not the first time, but at some point in time, I'm going to be, I'm going to have some success with it. So there has to be some belief and some confidence around that. And she helped me with that. Yeah. Huge. Huge. So, what? so, so huge. Yeah. 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 So I'm glad you said that because it reminded me of three big pieces of motivational interviewing that we focus on. You know, it's building people's confidence for change. Right? So that might be like you know, spending a lot of time thinking about, well, what other changes have you tried to make in your life? And, and how did you go about that? You know, what was it that you did that made you successful with that? Oh my God, like, you, know, you, you quit five months before. Obviously, you're going to do it, girl. Right? Like, you know, so it's really working on the confidence piece. Um, the other piece is that something has to be important to us. Right? So in order for me to make a change, it has to be important to me. If it's not important to me, I'm probably, I'm probably not going to do it. Right? It has to be so raising something up in, in terms of importance might be looking at, like, you know, and talking about all the different angles. Like, you know, why might this be important? What impact will this have on your future? Like, you know, what kind of impact has it had already? Like, you know, what, what impact has it had on, on other people? Like, you know, is, are you okay with that? How does this fit with your value system? Is this something like, you know, that you've seen through your life when you imagine you know, where it's going to be in, in five years' time? Right? So um, something has to be important. We can raise things up in terms of importance by talking about you know all the other things and where does it fit, right? And people have to be ready to make it a priority, all right? So that priority piece, when we know that change is difficult and we know that change um, can take quite a bit of energy, right? When we think about all that mental preparation and then the planning piece and you know, practicing for the marathon, right? You know, I need to be ready to make it a priority, and and that means I can't have ten other things. That are looking for my attention right now. All right, does that make sense? Mm, yes. Right. So when we think in terms of folks who are trying to make uh, changes to their substance use, right? Like, you know, sometimes there's unbelievable barriers, right? And unbelievable things are competing for priority. For example, like you know, there may be really good acknowledgement around the negative effects and all the harms that are coming in their lives and the people that care about them. Really, really good understanding and acknowledgement. And, and they know that, that changing actually is something that's important. Um, however, it's also really important that we have a way to cope with stress. It's also really important that we have a way to socialize with people, with their peers. It's also really important that they not feel the effects of withdrawal. It's also really important like, you know, that that fear of change is not something that we deal with right now when we've had X, Y, Z, emotional other things to manage. That priority piece right, that has to be there. So part of motivational interviewing is really working with folks and, and, and sussing it with them. Like, you know, where, where are you tripping up? We know that you need to have confidence. Something needs to be important. You need to be ready to make the priority in order to move from contemplation into preparation and planning. So where is and we'll all actually ask people. Like, you know, so it sounds like you really want to make this change. Like, you know, in terms of confidence, if I would say 10 is like you're 100% confident that this is something that you can do, and zero is you're not very confident where are you in terms of confidence? Right? And get people to scale it. Right? So then we know where we need to do some work. Right? 
sounds really simple. I'll say it that way, right? A really easy job. Do you do one on one counseling outside of, you know, do you, would you do quit cessation programs or anything like that or no? So outside of my, my yeah. professional work? No. Yeah. No. I don't do private practice. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's a retirement plan. <laughs> yeah. um, but Capital Hill has yeah. an amazing uh, self something program. Uh, yeah, I've done it three times. Yeah, right. So needing to step it up a little bit, right? You know, and maybe get a little bit more support you know, with the preparation and planning piece. So how can understanding this be helpful? Makes you aware of uh, the different steps and where you are. And uh, to me, the most important thing is to uh, do quite a bit of planning yeah. about uh, roadblocks or <laughs> hiccups or situations that you don't want to find yourself in if you're trying to solve a certain problem or make some changes. Yeah, well, I've reali really realized where I've fallen down, and it is in the preparation and planning yeah. stage. I like to just kind of do the action. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> jump, jump right Instant in. gratification, right? Yeah, I'm going to bed at night again. I'm not smoking in the morning. I'm not having a cigarette. I'm not doing it. Right. I wake up the next morning, but I'm not. That's it. So what would be, and that if it's okay if I ask, yes. right, what would be, like, you know, maybe, maybe one small step that would take you in planning? To, to not smoke. One small thing. What do you, I don't know. Well, you, you, you talked about you go into bed at night and you're like, yeah. nope, not yeah. going to smoke. Nothing. Well, no, I think I have to, I, I think I need to really think about all these these things and I like to write things out, you all know, right. the pros and cons, well, they're, the pros and cons are very little pros, yeah. con, or pros. <laughs> uh, you maybe know, maybe. I just have to do a lot, a lot more of that mental and I think Nancy won't charge me. I think I'll go there. <laughs> Nancy, yeah, you're going to be my brain. counselor. Because I know we've talked about it before. Oh. I mean, I've been smoking but more she, than 50 just, years. Yeah. You know, like. But you, don't, you have, yeah, you need some more Not contemplation. I need more. Oh, God, I've been contemplating so long. <laughs> well, contemplating and the planning. Yeah, but, yeah. yeah, but I really do. I, think I you really should need to. Because yeah. I happen to think there's a lot of pros to smoking. Yeah. See, I don't. Yeah. Well, not in terms of your health, obviously. No, or just your financial. The only thing of, it was a social thing, but it's yeah. not anymore because everybody has to go outside to smoke. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm so glad I don't have to be out here. I can go in in the <laughs> yeah. winter. You don't have rain. to stop partway oh. through the meeting and go out. Right. Yeah. The only good thing I can see about it is uh, my body wanted it, and I gave it to it. Yeah. But I honestly see. I thought it was my mind that wanted it, not my body. Well, so I think there's an example, emotional connection yeah. without a doubt. Yeah. And and so I didn't want to feed that with yeah. something else. Well, I had to think about what I was giving up because I like, for example, um, there were certain things that I always that always went along with smoking. For so, sure. for example, if I was having to learn something or having to do a physical writing job or something, I. It, it was yeah, something, a habit I developed when I was at school, right, was that I would have a cigarette while I was thinking mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. sorting out my mind, right? So to my mind, it helped me think better. I associated it with, I don't think it really made me think better, but I associated it with that. Or if I was out with other people, it gave me something to do if, if I felt socially awkward or... Mm -hmm. Uh, felt maybe I was alone and didn't know how to break into the group of people that were there. I could always entertain myself with a cigarette and not feel like I was the odd person sticking out. Um, gave me something to do with my hands. I mean, there sure. were a lot of little, sure. you know, when, at the end of a meal, it was something to look forward to, to sit down with a coffee. Sure. And yes. like, For yes. the longest time, I couldn't drink coffee after I quit because right. I couldn't imagine drinking coffee and not having a cigarette with. Well, I so think I had to give one, them both. One of the big hurdles is their life after cigarettes. Yeah, truly, because yeah. I smoked everywhere and with everything I did. Yeah. So that was yeah. my waking life. Yeah. You know, I mean, when I worked in buildings that I couldn't smoke in or couldn't smoke on the property, I brought my coffee in the thermos, beat it to my car, drove down off school property, and smoked my head off, and then I went back. <laughs> right. You know, right. I mean, but I had to kiss goodbye. I had to kiss all of those things goodbye. Like I had to look at that 
pretty much at that pro list and say, if you're really going to quit, you're really going to have to give that up, that thing that gives you comfort or that thing that makes you the feel hell you're safe. Have to go through. Or, yeah, so I had to look at the pros of smoking that okay. I meant, right. I, I think I meant it a little differently right. than it sounds. For sure. There's no real it. benefits yeah. to no, it, no. but there were things that happy Did moments you that I associate. Yeah, yeah right. I, lo I loved to smoke. I loved, people say, oh, I didn't, I don't even think about half the cigarettes I smoked. I enjoyed every one. I did, I smoked about a half a pack a day. I wasn't a big. I smoked a pack and a half. Right. right. See, I wasn't a frequent smoker, right. but those 10 cigarettes, I enjoyed Every yes. one of them. Yes. And so, to me, that pro list was pretty long. So a part of the making changes so is the con list, of course. Right? Like, you know, is, it, is when you're doing the pro, those pros and cons and figuring out, like, you know, what needs to be met here? Right? Because it sounded like you were pretty intuitive. You knew, like, you know, actually, it's not about the cigarette. It's about me feeling uncomfortable. It's about me needing something to do. It's about me needing a reward. It's about mm -hmm. me dealing with boredom. It's about me feeling like, you know, that I can prepare myself for an activity to think better, like, you know, by doing this, there were needs that were being met, mm -hmm. right? So a part of you being able to stop smoking, I bet, at some point, whether it was um, a conscious effort or not, it was really about figuring out and planning, how am I going to get those needs met? What am I going to do when I'm feeling really socially awkward and I don't really have anyone to talk to and I don't have a way to comfort myself, right? What am I going to do, like, you know, at, well, you said you had to give a coffee. <laughs> I did. I did. I totally right. did. That was one of the other plans. I'm pieces. drinking coffee. Yeah. <laughs> I was able to get that back. Um, but that's that's the preparation and that's the planning piece, mm -hmm. right? So <clears throat> there was a little bit more that I had um, intended to go into when talking about stages of change, but really it's around like, you know, how do you support somebody, and how do you want to be supported when you're in each of these stages, right? Because we know that change doesn't happen because we want it to happen. And we know that change doesn't happen for other people because we tell them it should happen. Right? Those are things that we know really quite clearly. And um, um, and I have some handouts that I'll that I'll leave for you guys. Like, you know, it's really this is pretty specific to how are you supporting somebody who's going through the stages of change and, and where they might be in that particular stage, right? Because if somebody is there in action, you don't really need to be talking to them about all of the cons of the juice, right? Like, you know, they're down there, they, they got yeah. it. Like, you know, they're past that. Like, you know, they, they figured that out. Otherwise, they would have never done anything to change, right? They figured that out. Um, just like when somebody is, is pre-contemplative, right? Like, you know, telling them that whatever they're doing, like, you know, is going to have all these harmful and negative effects, probably isn't going to help them really um, from not thinking about the harms into doing something different. Well, couldn't, you, couldn't you use motivational interviewing to say, yeah? What if you know, have you ever thought of this? Like, you know, how are you going to solve this? Yeah, that like that's still bringing up the topic. Yeah, yeah, that they might not have come up with on yeah. their phone. Yeah, that's beautiful. Actually, that, that's 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 beautiful, and that's quite different from saying you should do this or did you know? Like, you know that if you don't stop, then this is what's going to happen. What you're actually, the way I just heard you phrase that is really about raising awareness, right? Like, you know, maybe some of the education pieces, right? And really being quite gentle about it, right? So that's a beautiful thing to do with people. Now that I know how to do it. <laughs> well, like, the, the yeah. nagging uh, kind of like, you know, the, the controlling piece, like, you know, the, um, that those things tend not to work so well um, in pre contemplative, right? Like, you know, and, and sometimes so, like, you know, frustrated by somebody else, uh, somebody else's behavior or choices and where they are. Like, you know, we're seeing something very clearly. This is very clear. How can you not see this? Right? You know, we kind of fall into that trap for sure. Right? Um, mm -hmm. But some of the motivation and training would actually say what you just said. Right? Like, you know, raising the awareness like, you know, and providing access to information and, and resources. Um, it's funny how um, using this sort of strategies like motivational interviewing is so much easier with somebody else's child <laughs> or some uh, some unrelated person when your heart's in there like i feel i always used to say to my own say it sometimes still to my kids is that you've got my heart walking around in your body and it makes you crazy when you see something harmful happening and so being dispassionate, you know, and calm and professional and sensible and 
and um, no supportive okay. and <laughs> right? really, really, really hard to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, it might even be unrealistic to expect that. Yeah. Like, you know, all family yeah. members, right? You yeah. Know, so, so one of yeah, the Yeah, I almost said impossible. <laughs> no, well, that's it. You know, it's, it's, it's not almost unrealistic, impossible. right? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and, but there's some components of it, though, that may be helpful. Like one of the pieces of raising awareness, for example, when someone is pre contemplative, might be just allowing natural consequences for whatever the behavior is to, to occur. Right? Yeah, the only trouble with that is. Some natural consequences are pretty extreme. They're too high. The cost is too high. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And there's well, for the parent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes you don't even realize the consequences are harmful, or they just deal with it because it's part of their life. Yeah. yeah. How many uh, people do you have go through the program? <laughs> So we have, right now, along with the day treatment program. Uh, Sorry, with the what program? The day treatment program oh, day for, for, the, for addiction services. So, um, and the stages of change is just a model that we subscribe to. So there actually isn't a stages of change program. Like, no, this is a model that we oh, subscribe to. Yep, and so folks who come into that program are actually, um, it's, it's a two-week intensive program. And, mm -hmm. um, and folks would typically be in the preparation of planning or action. So folks, and if they're in action, like you know, they're usually typically fairly new to action. So, so we use this as a way of determining, like, you know, who's actually ready to come in and do this work, right? If if people are still, yeah, but but there's still a lot of benefits to my use, and you know what, you know, there's still this going on. They're probably still contemplative, and that's completely fine. Like, you know, we'll work with them to kind of get them into some of the planning and preparation pieces to then come into our program. Um, our program runs every three weeks. And, uh, and we take 12 people into our program every three weeks. Where, where's it run? It's at Bedford Grove. Yeah. Bedford Grove. Oh. It's uh, just a street off on lower water in between yeah. Prince and South Fork. Yeah. So that's about every three weeks, you say, mm -hmm. and 12 people. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, what, 200 people a year, mm -hmm. roughly? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And do you have... And I, I would imagine basically you're dealing with drugs, alcohol, and tobacco. Uh, drugs, alcohol, tobacco, and gambling. And gambling, yeah. right. Yeah. What, do you have statistics as to what kind of success rate you have? Success is actually a pretty trippy, I'm going to give you a politician answer. <laughs> 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 success is actually, is, is really, but, but it actually, it is tricky, right? Because, you know, our program would be just a part of a larger treatment program. Like, you know, so someone could have be on a treatment plan where they might have maybe maybe four or six individual sessions, then they come into our program, and then they're going to continue with some of the mm -hmm. uh, the weekly group therapy after they finish our two-week program, right? So it's really hard to isolate. Like, what was the impact of the two-week program that we had when there's is really just a component of all of their treatment? Okay. And success in addictions is actually something there's a lot of uh, debate back and forth around like, what actually constitutes success, mm -hmm. right? If somebody stopped for five months of uh, using tobacco, that's success. Even if they've gone back, that's success, right? They've given their body an amazing break, like, you know, from all those chemicals for five months, and they've actually improved their health, even by stopping for five months. And they've also done that important work of being able to prepare and plan for the next time they stop, and this time they stop for six years. So was that five months successful? It absolutely was. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so what constitutes success is always something that comes up um, and is debated quite heavily in the literature and research around addictions. If we want to look at success as being total abstinence, um, I'm not sure actually what the, what the rate would be for our program. Um, I don't know. Um, we actually, anecdotally, like I can say we have a great program and people do really well in it, but mm -hmm. uh, that's really subjective. I would think it would give people light bulb moments anyway, because yep. it's given me some actual. Yep. Yeah. We, well, what we do in our program is focus an awful lot on the preparation and planning and the action pieces, right? Like, you know, what's going to help you manage all of these barriers that are going to come up that's going to get in the way of you being able to make changes, right? So uh, that's an important part. So could some, could I call bed row just for smoking? Yeah. Like, I've been through the cessation programs and they don't really they don't focus on the press preparation and planning I mean you get the patch and you, you have your little talk and you get the patch or the gum or whatever you want but there's no you know you need to, you need to be a little more 
Yeah, yeah. It yeah. wasn't an 11 or a 12 week program. Or uh, it was, uh, program how, how long was it? Four weeks, five weeks, something like, yeah, something like that. Yeah. So anybody can go to that program? No, not no. anybody. Oh, okay. No, it actually is, it's referral based only, so you have to be referred into the program. Okay. Uh, by a clinician within the mental health and addictions program. Oh, okay. So it has to be, and and we actually have criteria around, you know, how um, um, other things you need to have tried before you come into the program, and and what the harms associated with the program would be, um, or associated with your use, sorry, before coming into the program would be. So we're kind of that middle of the road. We're actually a step up. We're considered a step up, step down program. Um, so it means that we're a step up. From folks who have who are doing maybe one-to-one -one counseling and other group treatment, we're a step up from that. We're, we're more intensive because we meet on a daily basis, um, but we're a step down from inpatient units. So we're kind of that, okay. that middle piece. And when you say you meet on a daily basis, how long do you meet for? So for, for two weeks. No, but I mean, so I come oh, Monday right, morning. Yeah. So, yeah. Are you there all yeah. day? Yeah. Oh, it's a full day yeah, every eight, day. Eight thirty wow. until three. Yeah, that's not that's not immediately obvious because I think yeah. most people think about some sort of you know substance abuse mm -hmm. program as being maybe you know five to seven at night yeah. three nights a week or yeah. something like that like not as intensive as all day every day for three weeks yeah. and that's a lot of so we do have that work. like you know whereas like maybe a couple times a week like you know and and really the best treatment um, for addiction is the treatment that's going to meet you where your needs are so there is no one size that fits all when it comes mm -hmm. to making changes to substance use, right? Like, you know, what works for Anthony might be different than what works for, for Donna, right? And, and the level of intensity may have to be different uh, depending on a lot of different core variables, right? So having those range of options and being able to find the treatment that's going to fit your needs is the most important thing. What would be the breakdown of the clientele amongst those four major addictions? Mostly alcohol. Mostly alcohol. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of who we see yeah. for treatment, yeah. Yeah, it definitely would be alcohol. Really? Um, and then I would say probably substance abuse. So, yeah. so folks who are struggling with alcohol in their working days. Okay. Yeah. So who do you work for? I'm sorry. Yeah. So I work for Capital Health. Okay. Yeah. Capital Health Addiction Program in Capital Health. Yeah. Um, is there are there any questions from the webinar? No. Is there a waiting list? Uh, not typically. Not typically, we're, we're typically able to get people in. Uh, and do you really see 200 people per year? Like, are there that many people? Our program's only been running since April. Okay. Yeah, so, so are you pretty full? But or? you're approaching. Yeah, we're approaching. Yeah. So, I, 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 I don't know the numbers, but if that's the math, then yeah. If, yeah. Well, that's the math yeah. roughly, I think, yeah. based on well, you can 12 fit, every three weeks. In a weeks. full year, you can fit but 17 weeks, 17 yeah. sections. Yeah. Yeah. Times twelve. Is I, I think we over two hundred. Actually, fifty. I think yeah. we can because so you're just under yeah, two hundred, maybe one hundred and eighty or something. The Christmas, the Christmas break. Right. right. But I would we, assume there's many, many, many times that of people who need <clears throat> the council. Yeah. So well, on just the just the alcohol alone in the city of yeah. Halifax, people who are um, having it impact their lives negatively. There's got to be thousands, mm. right? But this is mental health and addictions. Yeah. So, but if we look at, like, you know, the, this would be just one treatment option, right? Like, yeah. You know, and it would yeah. be a part of a broader treatment plan, right? Like, you know, so folks right. would have access to other things, and not everybody would need this level of intensity, and other folks would need a higher level of intensity. Mm -hmm. So, um, so when we look at it, yes, it's, it's only 200 people yeah. in a year, right? But this is just one of the yeah. options yeah. that's available for them as so, well. I take it that you've got to, the people that come to you have to be out of the pre contemplative state. Yes, they have. So when people right. come to us, they're preparation planning and right. or action. Because I Otherwise, would think a really large number of those people that we might say currently are struggling with a substance abuse problem, yeah. a lot of them aren't out of pre contemplative yet, right? right. Yeah. They're That's not right. seeking a program or a, right. an approach or a treatment option. Is that piece around like you know, it has to be the change has to be important. The change has to be something that you're ready to make a priority, and you have to have some level of confidence that you're going to be successful with it, right? So that has to kind of superimpose on all of the people you know, who are um, who are looking to make changes or maybe need to make changes. Right? So um, I'm noticing the time. 
Um, yes. It's, it's 8 o'clock, and I know you guys have a second part to your meeting. Um, so I wonder if there's are there any final questions that I can take in the next minute and a half before we leave? <laughs> Thank you all. You know, it's, it's been Thank you. I, I could sit here and talk about this for like. <laughs> That's wonderful. I'd like to, uh, on behalf of the group here and uh, through the province, uh, I'd like to thank you very much for uh, uh, coming here tonight and uh, talking to us about this. It's something that is probably uh, very near and dear to the hearts of uh, all of us here, one way or another. Mm -hmm. And uh, it seems that uh, addiction is uh, very prevalent uh, amongst those with schizophrenia. So it's always interesting and, and very worthwhile to hear of uh, ways to uh, to help our loved ones deal with that. So again, thank you very much. Thank Appreciate very much. that. And I guess that concludes our presentation tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.